Hello everybody and welcome to a short little bonus episode of the Minecraft Disney World Q&A. This is the series in which you all submit your questions regarding anything Disney related really and I try to give you my answers to the best of my ability. Um, we're here in MC Magic, the recreation of Walt Disney World and I'm going to wander around, check out this awesome recreation while answering these six questions that have been submitted for this mini episode and let's just jump right into them. So first up we have b 4 t 56 games who asked, Hey Rob, I was wondering what you thought of the new Disney animatronics they have started using. I know you're not a big fan of making rides that go directly with a movie, in this example, The Seven Dwarves, but I was just wondering, thanks. Uh, so just to clear that up, I'm not like against rides that are based on um, movies. I'm just against like heavily favoring one over the other too much. I love original rides. I think there should be more original rides. I think Iger leans a little bit too much on basing it on previously established IP, uh, but that doesn't mean I dislike that. You know, um, I'm not against the Seven Dwarves Mine uh, train roller coaster. I can't wait to ride it. And to answer your question, I think those animatronics are amazing. Uh, I've seen videos of it online between that and like uh, the Cars animatronics and Cars Land blow me away i just i remember disney from when i was a young kid and that was the early 90s and animatronics then were very stiff and even though they were improvements over the ones that like walt had been developing you know in the the 60s with you know lincoln and things like that uh it still didn't feel very lifelike and now you're starting to see them move with such fluidity that it's it's really impressive i think walt would be um you know, this is one of the things where I think I'd, I could be confident in saying that I think Walt would be blown away with the quality of, of what what has been developed in that stage. So I think it's really fantastic. Next question comes from Disney Lover 13 who asks, Hey Rob, here's a question for you. Have you heard of the 3DS game called Disney's Magical World? What are your thoughts? Have you played it? Do you think it was a good choice for Disney as a whole? Thanks and have a great week. Uh, so here's the thing. I didn't... <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know about this game until you asked that question and I had to look it up. So it's a 3DS game. It does exist. Um, I believe it was published by Nintendo, but I'm not sure who developed it, if it was Disney in-house or they sourced it out. But what it basically seems to be with what I've seen when I looked it up is it's a um, sort of like a fetch quest game. You're sort of s thrown into this magical world that resembles the hub of the Magic Kingdom quite a bit. And you find all these characters. Some of them are Disney characters. Some of them are characters I've never seen before, like the king. Um, and you, they request something like a card or, you know, just an item. And you go get it from somewhere and then you give it to them and then you get a prize. And as far as I could tell in like a 40 minute clip, that's pretty much all you're doing. And then you can like customize a few things and you go to these different worlds. It, it very much seems like a game that was tailored to the younger audiences. Um, I don't know, like from a business perspective, what they were thinking when they put it out. Uh, I can't wrap my head around like what their position there was because it doesn't seem like the sort of game that, uh, first of all, an enthusiast gamer would pick up. And even then it seems so bare bones that I don't even think a lot of Disney fanatics would pick it up. Personally speaking, after watching that video, I have no real interest in that game. Uh, the best I could come up with is I can imagine that maybe parents who aren't gamers see that, see, you know, that it takes place in Disney. They have this nostalgic uh, feeling that comes with it, and then they pick it up for their kids who play it because, you know, when you're a kid and you get a video game, you're going to play it because, you know, you don't always have the opportunity to, to keep grabbing games. So I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. I can't tell. I honestly, I suggest everybody, if you're interested, look it up. It's called Disney's Magical World for the Nintendo 3DS. It looks weird. It it seems, it doesn't even seem like, I can't even say like it's a cash grab, right? Because it just doesn't seem like it's there's enough there for it to be a cash grab. It seems like maybe I've heard of, and in the movie world, there have been cases where like contractually a company has to work with another company on something. And so they'll like develop like really lousy movies and they'll be like, okay, well, you know, this actor was contractually obligated to make a third movie with this production company. So they're going to do this lousy movie. And maybe it was like that. Maybe they had a publisher and they were just like, we, we need you to make another game. So spit one out. I don't know. It's, it's bizarre. Uh, but interesting question. 
Our next question comes from Laughalot54, who asks, Who is your favorite music composer for Disney? I love Alan Menken since he's done most of the songs from the Disney Renaissance, but I also love the couple who wrote Finding Nemo the Musical and the soundtrack for Frozen because it reminds me of the musicals on Broadway. Uh, great question. Here's I'm going to throw you a curveball. You picked a great composers there. I'm not going to pick a movie composer. I'm going to pick a composer named Bruce Broughton. I hope I pronounced his last name right. Bruce Broughton, actually, I should crack it myself. He has composed movies. He's composed The Rescuers Down Under. He's composed Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. He composed Bambi 2. Now, you might be wondering why I would pick him as a favorite. Those movies don't necessarily ring as Disney classics. Well, he's also composed a number of attractions. He composed the soundtrack for Tough to Be a Bug, for Timekeeper, for Ellen's Energy Adventure, for the new Spaceship Earth, uh, O Canada, and, and more beyond that. And so uh, he's my favorite for those, especially Spaceship Earth and Ellen's Energy Adventure. You know, I remember hearing the new Spaceship Earth theme and thinking of how thematically it sounded so similar to Ellen's Energy Adventure I, that I wondered if, you know, it was composed by the same person, did a little digging, and sure enough, it was. And after seeing other things, it's no surprise, you know, Timekeeper is another ride I really enjoy, um, or the attraction I really enjoy the soundtrack up for. So uh, definitely he would go up there as one of my favorite Disney composers, for sure. Other than that, I guess you would say the... Um, uh, ooh, this is... Why is my mind drawing a blank right now? The, the Sherman Brothers. The Sherman Brothers, who composed a lot of songs for Disney, both in uh, screen and in attractions. They would probably, you know what, they'd probably go up there above Bruce. Bruce and them all up, three-way tie. The two the two Shermans and, and Bruce. Uh, those are my choices. Of course, the Sherman Brothers, if you don't know who they are, I mean, it's a great big beautiful tomorrow, and it's a small world, things like that. You could, you know, classic Disney um, rides are where you can see that. So, great question. Uh, my question for you guys, who's your favorite composer out there? My next question comes from Andrew1101, who asks, um, Do you think Disney should build the Tomorrowland People Mover all throughout Magic Kingdom, like a tour telling you the history about all the rides? Uh, interesting, interesting proposal there. Uh, yes and no. Yes, I would love to see more use of the technology behind the TTA. I think you already see it a lot. It's basically an Omni Mover, right? But on a well, not even the Omni Mover is sort of a little bit different. The TTA is a little broken up. Um, you know, Walt had intended for the People Mover to be the system of transportation in Epcot, the city. So it is no stretch to imagine it being used as a system of transportation around a theme park. So, yeah, in that sense, I wouldn't mind it. Uh, on the other hand, I wouldn't call it the TTA uh, or the People Mover. Well, maybe the People Mover, but not the TTA, because you, once you leave Tomorrowland, it can't be the Tomorrowland Transit Authority, right? I also don't think it should really be a history ride about Disney World, because while I love the history of Disney and will read anything, and I hope you all do as well, or else I'm not sure why you're watching these videos, uh, I don't think the average person's that interested, and... I think it would kind of go against the spirit of Disney World to put so much focus on itself. You know, Disney World's about going to another place. It's about the magic of going to another land or going to a different, you know, attraction. And I think it sort of breaks that fourth wall to have a ride that just talks about itself, essentially. Um, now, there are places for that. You have the Walt uh, Disney Museum in California. You've got... Um, one man's dream which is i think a nice little tribute to walt himself but putting something about the history of the parks in the park seems a little too self-serving and I, I don't know if i'd be behind that but the idea of getting a people mover around more i'm totally behind that can we also get it in manhattan please can i just use it to go around my neighborhood that'd be nice thanks next question and oh boy this is a good one it comes from b fish alex imagineering who asks two questions we'll read them off one at a time. One, do you think Eisner actually cared about the well-being of Disney as a company? Like, do you think he would have done the same with any other company, or do you think he just wanted to fill his wallet? No jab at his character. Uh, yes, he absolutely loved uh, the company, and I think he cared about the company. 
here's the thing. A lot of people will give him a bad rap and CEOs a bad rap in general. And certainly there are a number of CEOs out there who deserve it. But uh, after reading Disney War, which is a pretty unbiased look at his time at the Disney company, and after reading Work in Progress, which was his ghost-written autobiography, he put so much time of and so much of his life into this company. You know, the, the takeaway here, I don't know how other CEOs do it. Maybe some of them come in at 9 and they leave at 5 and they make a few decisions and they go home. But that wasn't what Eisner was doing. Eisner was basically... You know, he was the CEO of Disney first and then himself second. And he was that way for nearly 20 years. So uh, I don't think anybody will do that much work without caring a bit. You know, did he do it for the money? Sure. As a CEO, his job is to make the company money. You know, that's that's what he's there to do. And I think it's not mutually exclusive. I, I think he could he could care about the company and also care about making money. Um, which is definitely what he did do. Uh, so I would say yes, he definitely cared about the well-being of Disney as a company because it would reflect on him if he didn't, by the way. Like if, if the company, you know, as CEO, it all comes down to him. If the company fails, it's his fault. Even if it isn't really his fault, it's his fault. That's just sort of what happens when you're at the top of the chain. So even in a self-serving matter of just not wanting to look bad in the business world, he cared about the company's well-being. Uh, but beyond that, I think... He he went with Disney, you know, I it seemed a lot like there were, I mean, I'm trying to go back to sort of the early years, and he definitely had these dreams of being the man on top, because he had some pretty solid offers on the table within the film community that he turned down to be CEO for Disney, so, you know, it definitely, he, he had himself on his mind, but uh, once you become that CEO, you're going to care about the company. So definitely, 100%. Uh, number two, as you know, many tall structures built at Disney World use force perspective and are just under 200 feet due to Florida law stating that you must have a blinking light on the top of structures for airplanes, which would kill the ambience. But by, uh, but by pushing the envelope, do you think they are endangering their guests? Those laws are there for a reason, right? Uh, that's a good That's a good line of logic, I think, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. So yes, there is a law. If it's the structure's 200 feet, there needs to be a blinking red light on top, and Disney intentionally builds things just a hair under that so that they can be as tall as possible without needing that light. Um, and like you said, for that reason, it's so that the ambience isn't killed. The 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 this castle here with the blinking light on top would totally kill the mood, right? Let's warp to Epcot, by the way, for fun. Um, do I think they're endangering people? No. And here's the thing. Yeah, it is a law for a reason, right? But I would also extend that logic and say it's 200 feet for a reason. And odds are, and I'm not a lawmaker and I don't work in aviation, but if I were to go about designing a law like this, I would find out what, uh, what, what is the safest height um, statistically, and then I would make it even lower just to play it safe. So maybe they looked at it and they said, okay, well, planes, I mean, you have to realize for an airplane or an aircraft, 200 feet is super low. Like, that's really, really low. An airplane shouldn't ever be flying that low, uh, especially over Disney airspace, where I think it's restricted ever since 9-11. Um, you know, that's not going to be the case. It, you know, those lights are there, I think, as a precaution for planes that get lost or, or having trouble. Um, I think, though that 200 feet is probably the safer number and so to be a little under it i think is just fine without a light um there ha i don't think there's been any history of any aircraft striking any of these buildings so there's that going for it um and i think i think the odds of that happening a case where some aircraft's in trouble manages to wander into space it shouldn't be in and then manages to hit a building that is there now also think about this if you're also, you have to consider this. Let's say that there was a light on it. Again, a plane shouldn't be that low, right? So a plane shouldn't be hitting anything like that unless it's in trouble. And if it's in trouble, well, I don't know how much the light is going to play into them avoiding hitting something. And I think the takeaway here, and I'm sort of rambling about it because I don't know how to best put it. The takeaway is that I just think the, the odds of anything happening at 199 feet without that light 
due to it not having a light are so astronomically low that it'd be hard to say that it's putting their guests in, in, in danger. But I think that's a really interesting question. That's really a question that's outside of the box. I love sort of questions like this that really make me think about the parks and the, the, the company in a different way. So thank you for sending it in. Um, you know, Disney, Disney has a history of avoiding red tape and avoiding um, the laws. You know, the idea is Disney World is built on Reedy Creek Improvement District, which was set up by Disney in such a way so that they didn't have to deal with the same regulations that a normal city, uh, a construction project in a regular city would, would need. And that wasn't so that they could make the rides unsafe or skip dealing with safety. It's so that they could do it in their own way. And, and Disney, I think, is an incredibly safe place. Of course, it's got this history of accidents like any other place, but I think overall it's incredibly safe and... Disney is not one to cheapen out on on safety for, you know, something like aesthetics. And then our last question this week comes from Jeremiah Rivera, who has a really good chain record here of great questions. Um, and the question is, oh, yes, I just recently heard the news that certain character meet and greets in the parks now require a fast pass plus reservation. This means that apparently anyone can't just get on a standby line to meet certain characters anymore. They must first get a fast pass. I think this is a big issue because for people like me who go during the off seasons, we normally wouldn't need fast pass considering that the lines are much shorter. What do you think of this? Is this just ruining the fun and spontaneity uh, of spontaneously being able to walk through the parks without trouble of planning out every second of the day? So this, like the 3DS game was something I had not heard of until you mentioned it. I looked it up, I read the link that you sent, and sure enough, that is the case. They are going to be introducing some character meet and greets, I believe in Epcot was one of them, uh, where you need a Fast Pass Plus reservation to do it. I think one of the examples was Winnie the Pooh at the UK Pavilion. And here's the trick, and this is this has made me think differently about the question, is it's they're they're considered tier one. So the idea is Fast Pass Plus reservations are limited and tiered. So that's to prevent you from, say, taking your uh, three Fast Pass Pluses for the day and doing, you know, Tower of Terror, Toy Story, Midway Mania, and Rock and Roller Coaster. You know, what they would do is give it a tier and say, okay, you could do one tier one, one tier two, which might be like the great movie ride, and then maybe like a tier three, I guess, which might be, I don't know, the Backlot Studio Tour. And the idea there is they don't want you hogging all the Fast Pass spots for these major rides, and they want to incentivize you to try using Fast Pass for these smaller rides. And I think that's a great idea in itself. Uh, by making these character meet and greets, and then odd ones too, like Winnie the Pooh, um, a tier one is very, it's making me scratch my head a little bit. I think my theory is that they're doing this to try and, I guess, take some pressure off of the other tier one attractions. By they, maybe they think, you know, kid really wants to see Winnie the Pooh. Parent needs to see this kid see Winnie the Pooh. So they use their Fast Pass Plus and now they can't use it on Soren. And now Soren gets, you know, relieved a little bit. I can't imagine statistically that there are many cases of that happening, so I'm not 100% sure if that's the reasoning behind it. That's just my speculation. Uh, but in general, I don't like the idea of something being ex exclusive to Fast Pass Plus. Like you, Jeremiah, I actually, I, I wasn't really happy with the idea of Fast Pass Plus as a concept. Uh, I, like you, enjoy spontaneously enjoying Disney. I enjoy the magic that comes from wanting to do something one minute and then going to do it and then doing it. Um, and having the idea of having to plan the trip so far and ahead is sort of kills the fun for me personally. Now there, there are vacationers out there who are the opposite. And if they go in there without a plan, they're going to be stressed and they're not going to have a good time and it's going to be a bummer. And I think we previously existed in this harmony where people who wanted to plan to the minute could and then people who wanted to wing it could wing it. And FastPass Plus came along and sort of gave that option to plan what ride you were going to be on at what time, like, way in advance. Um, but I kind of begrudgingly was okay with... Like, I, I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't upset over it. I wasn't happy with it, but at the same time, because regular FastPass still existed, standby lines still existed... You know, I did not have to use FastPass Plus. I could always still just get in line for Soren when I want to ride Soren and 
go and do it. And so because I had that option, I was fine. Uh, but now we're setting this precedent where there's something here where, like, if I want to go see Winnie the Pooh, I have to buy into this Fast Pass Plus system. Of course, not literally buy into it. It comes with, you know, it's fr it's free. I don't have to pay for that. But, you know, I have to start using the system that I originally didn't want to to do the thing that I wanted to do. And it's without a clear ex explanation from Disney as to why that's happening. I think it's harder to swallow. Um, so all I could do is, I guess, try and guess why they might be doing that. Uh, I don't really know. Like, I just I can't see that many people using their tier one Fast Pass Plus to see Winnie the Pooh. Now, if you had made it like Anna and Elsa, oh man, forget about it. Soren lines would be super empty because those Anna and Elsa lines would be insane. And that'd be what a way because it's so popular right now. You know, if the other thing I thought of was maybe this is temporary. Maybe you won't see this be a permanent thing. This is just their way of forcing people to acknowledge Fast Pass Plus and get people who don't know about it to try it out for the first time by saying, well, if you want to ride this, you need or you want to see these characters, you have to use it. Uh, but then again, why not do Anna and Elsa? There's a way of making everybody acknowledge Fast Pass Plus. You know, you ask, oh, well, where's the line for Anna and Elsa? Oh, well, you just Fast Pass Plus it. You know, I guess you have too many angry parents in that case. But even then, why not? Um, there's got to be a popular middle ground between Anna and Elsa and Winnie the Pooh. Uh, I don't know. I think it's really bizarre. Uh, but another fantastic question, you know, and thank you for pointing it out because I had not heard of this until this point. Uh, I want to thank everybody for sending me questions. If you have a question regarding the parks, you're going on vacation and you want advice, you want to know a little bit about the history of something or your thoughts on the business side of things or anything like that, uh, opinions, who's your favorite this or that, feel free to leave it in the comments below. Uh, I do kind of break these up a little bit, so um, don't feel discouraged if your question's not answered. Sometimes it's because I've already recorded the next video or sometimes I just haven't gotten back to those questions yet. I try to get as many as possible. I want to thank you all for watching. By the way, if you enjoy this series, keep an eye out because uh, without going into too much detail, there should be more of it per week soon. And I, that's all I'll say for now. I think, you know, before June, there'll be some more news about what I'm doing with the series. Um, have a fantastic week. Whatever you guys are doing, make the most of it because it makes it that much better. If you want to ask me your question uh, for a faster response, feel free to ask it on Twitter. I'm at Rob Plays on Twitter. Might not end up in the video because my memory is awful, but at the very least, maybe you'll get a, an answer on Twitter right away. Um, I'm also on Facebook at Rob Plays That Game. I also do so many other Minecraft series, some about Disney, some about Minecraft in general, and then I have another channel called Rob Plays Those Games where I just play other video games that are Minecraft. Some of those are Disney too, like Disney Infinity. You can't wait for Disney Infinity 2.0. I'm gonna so buy me a Captain America figurine. Uh, have a great week, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your questions. And I will see you all next time for the next Disney Q&A. Bye, everyone.